Yeah. Um, it sounds like a big topic, long run land use change management, and it is. Uh, the, what you'll find is that um, if a little bit of the advertising that uh, Catherine added that I didn't was how to talk to different kinds of people. If you're going to do long run land use change management, one observation is that the land is local, it happens with individual people, and if you want to know how the land use is going to change, you have to know what kind of people are on it right now. You have to know how they're making decisions about what they'll accept and how the type of people may change. With that at the beginning, what that ends up sounding like large land use change management is extremely local. And that's what I want to say it is. Um, I have a few examples here I'll just go through of uh, large land use change attempts that almost always fail and then we'll finish with something that we know locally, which is, in Lo which is Lubbock housing. These are just different land uses. Um, in terms of uh, high and low resolution, I picked these because in one study that I had, uh, I looked at, these were all listed as rural, as one land use. Uh, and they're all different. And any one of those, with time, can become any one of the other ones. Uh, so there are some changes, good or bad, hard to say, right? But those changes happen. That clearly is going to change the type of person we have. And the greatest land use change that's happening, however, in the, right now, especially with climate concerns, is the concessions given to logging and clearing. Um, and it looks like this. That's, that's Borneo. That's Brazil. That's also Malaysia, uh, clearing for palm. Given that, we have another problem. Uh, never in my life growing up as a farmer did I ever think this would happen, but we actually might have trouble meeting food supplies in 30 or 40 years for the first time. Now, it's always been, it's about distribution. Um, what's the distribution? You have enough food, but distribution is becoming much more difficult. The yields, all these patterns show the same thing. You can see the reduced rate of, of growth in yields per acre, there are, except in ethanol-related crops, there are reducing acres most, of, most places in the world, and the distance between population and food supply is catching up. I don't think it will pass, but distribution is becoming harder. Moving it from where it is to where it isn't is much more difficult. There are a lot of political uh, problems associated with it as well. In the 90s, with uh, a lot of trade and, and a, a temporary surge in democracy across the world, those, those were getting better, and they've, they've reversed themselves at an accelerated pace over the last 10 or 15 years. Okay, another example, that's just wheat, and that's all um, seaborne trade. So with that, what do we do? Uh, well, first, land use is spatially defined and it occurs locally. And that means it's less about central planning. If you try to solve that problem with central planning, you're not going to get there. Um, the uh, acreage in Borneo that I'm associated with, the way to get that out is to find another use for the land other than clearing it for palm. Um, so you, can, you have op options locally of creating something like this or creating something like this. Can be really small things in urban areas. Those are little pocket parks. Or they can be big things. Here's an example, though, of a policy that was, how do we manage this all at once? Uh, despite the warnings from people in my profession going to the early 60s, Bruce Babcock wrote, uh, He's one of the first fellows of the American Agricultural Economic Association, said, please don't, whatever you do, don't ever, please ever do, do ethanol, please. <laughs> That's about what he said. <laughs> and that was 50 years ago. Um, it really illustrates the need to be careful. Um, and to notice what happens on the ground with individual landowners. One of the things that economists predicted, I think, surprised people was the indirect land use change. Once you had, uh, once you had made an advantage of, uh, of corn, people started planting corn in places that they really shouldn't be planting it, and a lot of prairie land was converted into, into corn production. Right here in Castro County, 
uh, where we have the deepest water in the county, all of that converted in two years from, all of that converted from two years to cotton to corn. Um, and in, uh, obviously with high impacts on the water use. Another thing that you miss when you try to do large planning, and this always, I always giggle at this as a farmer, uh, unplanned drought contingencies. I, I looked everywhere to find any time when anybody was looking at ethanol production, for example, nationwide and said, what would happen in a drought? I see lots of, uh, lots of planning articles out of DOE saying, well, you'll never have a drought large enough to affect the national supply so it can always move around. And you know, I'm sitting there scratching my head, you mean except for the 10, 10 exceptions to that over the last century, right? Um, so we ended up with not enough corn and we ended up with plants that had just been built. This one has moved out toward the prairie and, and, and ends up bankrupt. About 10% uh, about of the plants in the country will probably not only go bankrupt but not reopen. Um, and that's, that's a, when you think about the massive investment of that on the landscape, it's huge. Right? These are 50, 100 million, million gallon uh, plants. And you know, it's, uh, it's all created by a subsidy and then it removes when there's, when there's a problem. Okay. This is really more the prescriptive side. Being careful means being local and statistically sound. One of the ways we do planning, especially in water, uh, water policy, which is run by large reservoir systems, a lot out in the west is, and in the area I work in the southeast is, is that it's so complicated, we say, look, let's just take the mean of all the things that we care about. Let's take the drought of record over the last 50 years. Let's take the mean population rate. But the natural distributions of systems that we work with looks like this, right? So you take this mean and you take that mean and you try to plan to those. <coughs> the mode is down here and this mode is over here. It, the, with making a very long story short, that's the best picture I can think of. That doesn't work, and it just doesn't work. We've overcommitted the system in the southeast where there's, imagine having 37 inches of rain a year. Uh, we've overcommitted that system largely because we're trying to resolve very local environmental and ecological problems from 120 mi 28 miles away by releases out of a reservoir. And it, it can't do it. It just can't do it. So you have to have a base reservoir policy and then you solve these things locally. Um, there's been almost no management over the conflict in the southeast for local management or responses to local problems like this. It's been waylaid until the tri-state uh, policy is resolved. My, my point is, without some sort of statistical modeling here, you're not going to get anywhere and you're not going to see the problems that you have. Quite simply, if you want to worry about droughts and floods, variance requires risk and risk requires statistics. Um, some examples, we had that overcommitted. Uh, the restrictions, there's a, a, a lot of unintended consequences. Uh, I'll leave this and people can argue with that as they like, but putting restrictions on irrigations tends to induce farmers to leave irrigated farming faster. Uh, why would I stay in a less profitable activity longer? So we may focus on this. I would say for the region, what we want to focus on is long run land use change, steering the ship a little so that when you end up at the place, you end up with what you need, right? Whatever that is. Uh, some sort of dry land conversion, some use for the water that's left. Plan that, people will plan around, that, uh, around this. I'm worried right now if we, uh, that one of the things we may do is as people replace irrigation systems, and a lot of them are due, they're not going to go with the most efficient ones because they can't afford it now. Um, so we may have some problems. All right, bioenergy markets. Um, not just do we have these indirect land use changes, but these things are correlated with each other. It, it, one of the nice things when we were growing beans was bio oils were unrelated to the oil market. They, were, they weren't negatively correlated. They weren't risk reducing, but they weren't risk augmenting, right? They didn't go with it. Uh, now, with the energy policy over the last 10 years, edible oils now flow in sync with, or co-integrated with, um, are co-integrated with oil markets, which makes for 
uh, adds more variability to the commodity markets, which are already unstable. Uh, okay. That's just a nice picture to show that social scientists can confuse people, too. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, here's where I really want to go, is take people where they're at. Um, I'll use a couple of examples. I've, you, most of you are bored with hearing them. When I first got here, we were talking about range management. And I was over at the Chamber of Commerce, and I said, man, you guys really need a range ecologist. And you could have heard a pin drop, everyone looking at me. Um, I was like, well, OK. How about Ron Sosby? And they go, oh, yeah, Ron, what a great guy. Let's use Ron, who's, by the way, a range ecologist. And so the words matter in how you frame these things. We use climate variability rather than climate change. It makes a lot more difference. I found a difference in another study sort of related to stuff that Dr. Bakke does, the difference between stewardship, between even here in Dallas. Stewardship means a whole lot more. It's freighted with a whole lot more active management in, in Lubbock than it is in urban, uh, urban Dallas, even thinking that the folks are fairly, fairly similar. So how do we partition these? Well, I'm just going to go past those. We did a study just to give an example of this. A lot of the time, this is just residential real estate in Lubbock. It's not handling the big problems, but the problems are the same. Uh, people making decisions about what they buy and where they buy it. The first thing we found in Lubbock is that green space isn't the same. People around this park, which we uh, know is the, is the one in Tech Terrace, don't use it, and the people who live around it have a lower value than the people a block away. So living right on the park isn't necessarily an advantage to you. Around the corner, we have that. That was Friday afternoon. And it's much more active. It's a lot smaller. That's green space that sort of counts. And that's going to shape the neighborhood a little bit more. So we found two types. First were, you might call them professors, but people more like <laughs> professors. <laughs> I'm a, I, I, I look at my own house that I had in the area, and I look at my own demographics, and I was like, gosh, I'm almost the prototypical type one absent the Birkenstocks. But um, it, as you see, it has some environmental advantages. It has vegetation, not only just more vegetation, slightly older, slightly smaller houses, proportionate to the size of the lot. And you have a more progressed landscape, which we found was conducive to larger uh, bird life uh, uh, variability. It has other, uh, other advantages. And there's another one, a little lower end. You can see a bit more uh, vegetation at different levels. And what we found people were really view, valuing was streetscape. It wasn't just what was on their property, but they wanted to drive home and look at this. And I cheated it a little bit because I knew this result was going to happen. There's been some cognitive psychology work that looks at different types of people and shows them different things and sees whether their heart rates increase or not, whether they become more anxious or not. Our type ones look at this and they sort of calm down, right? Um, our, our type twos don't. They look at that and they think of that as really different. Um, this is a beautifully landscaped uh, lawn. It obviously is not like the one we saw before. Um, it has some advantages to it in terms of um, uh, energy use efficiency, even with a large house that it is. It has, there's another one from a tech employee, and this is a little lower end. Uh, and that's across from a school, so it has a little higher value for these people. And these people are just a little bit different than the other type two we have across the street. And here is the thing that calms them down when they drive home. It's different. It's not without vegetation. It's, it has a wider street. And different people react to those differently. And the reason I bring this up, too, is just like the land use that I started with, this area, I can't find a study in regional science that would not consider all of this area identical and uniform. Mm -hmm. And all of the policy about what kind of green space you put in, what kind of zoning on vegetation, what kind of setback rules you make, vary on, in some cases street by street, but generally neighborhood by neighborhood. So the takeaway lesson on that is figure out who your folks are and work at it. And why it really counts is in transitional neighborhoods like this. This is, this is about the most type one 
pro professorial egghead you could possibly imagine. Those of you who know Dr. Perry, that's Dr. Perry's house. Um, <laughs> and notice, keep your eye on the truck over here. We'll take a little better picture of it. That, that's a little bit more what it looks like when you drive up to it. And how do I know that this is a transition neighborhood? Because that's their next door neighbor. Uh, how you zone this particular area or the areas that this person would move to if they got a little bit more money or the Perry's would move to in a little bit more money, making sure it's designed for the kind of persons that are likely to be there is not that hard to do. You just have to see ahead of it and get out in front of these things. That way you're not doing any land use changes at the last minute. You're planning these things for, for directions for, for, for decades. Uh, last, I'm just going to say what it requires. I haven't talked about any of the methods for this. It does require that you, we, we often survey people, obviously. Uh, I'm the only regional scientist I know right now who's surveying people regularly. We work, we do a lot of statistical work, a lot more than just comparing means. We, uh, we cluster persons, we cluster type, we look at space, and then after we do our initial clustering, we update the whole thing to make sure it's consistent. Um, we, uh, what we get, and we've, by backdating, we get a lot better predictive power of land use change and the type of land use user. The last lesson on that is, if you're looking at the user as being more or less conducive to the outcomes you want, you have to set policy now not just to, uh, not just to uh, help the land use that you want and help the people that you think are there, but if you're changing the type of person, you need to make sure that the long-run policy you have is conducive with the kind of person you have. That sounds awfully complicated, but it's not. When you look at ethanol policy in the southeast, nobody was growing corn. Um, after 2006, corn exploded. You look at the people who are growing corn, and they fall into two types. All in corn. I'm all in, right? I'm 100% in corn. I've got, the most, uh, I've got the best irrigation system I can find. And those with adaptable systems going, yeah, these policies come and go. I, you know, I, I, I'll plant corn with what I have, and I'll also plant some cotton over here, and I'll leave these things. If you're looking down the road, and you want to reverse this policy, if you have a policy that shifts, that pushes out the last type and pushes in the, the short-term maximizer for 10 years, when you finally try to get a sustainability policy, you're going to be up against the wrong kind of person. Mm -hmm. right? It's not going to match. So when you're doing long-run planning, it isn't that hard, really. Most of the agricultural land is still, was agricultural 50 years, 70 years ago. Most of the downtown urban land is the same. The suburban area is fairly predictable. Um, it's, you know, we think of these changes as really massive. Their environmental impacts are massive, but they're fairly, they're fairly predictable. And so where I'm leaving it is the best way to handle really big problems is to involve really local people. Okay, Thank thanks. Is that it? Was I too long? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So your assumption was that people stay within their person type because mm -hmm. they no. not change. Like if you're living next to the Perrys long enough, perhaps yeah. your view of what a nice neighbourhood might change. Well, they, they might they might move. We had another. We did a study, for example, on um, on physical activity, right? And so, what would happen if people move? Uh, we we are assuming they move, right? So you put in a nice park right next to a place and you say, you know, five years later, there's all this new physical activity. Well, what we found was a whole bunch of people who like to be physically active bought out the people who aren't going to move off the couch and they moved into the neighborhood. There was no benefit, health benefit, of the green space that was there. So the people don't change. They, is they spatially swap over? Well, no, they're moving. As the well, type, I mean. one type is moving in as the other but type. But the individuals themselves? Not, not so much. Well, we don't classify them. Yeah. Actually, what we do is we classify them on a continuum. So there's some people in there that are about 50-50 each type. There's people that are 60-40, 70-30, and 90-10. Um, but they're still about 20 years later. They, no, they don't all, they don't all stay the same. Uh, but we're saying, we, we do allow for change in types. What we're saying is you can look at, depends on what level you're looking at, right? 
uh, if you're looking at deep-seated uh, changes, typically uh, people don't change what they call core beliefs. They will change secondary beliefs, right? So you can change a person that's, you, you, you can change a person to recycle who doesn't really care about the environment, they'll do that. But they won't fundamentally change typically over their lifetime at their core. That makes sense. Yeah. So how do you, with this change in population, how do you account for the students who are coming in and buying housing in the city? Mm -hmm. And very quickly, like in tech pairs thereafter, they're sold again. Isn't that just a huge? They're pretty you know? stable. It's pretty stable. Houses that are, houses that rent, rent continuously, but houses they, they, they that are buy them. They don't yeah. rent them. Oh, I understand. They buy them and then they. Yeah. But they're the same type of people, right? They're the same type. They're the same type. That, the, the, the one of the interesting things in the movement of this is, is we're not talking about people being changing or people being stable. We're talking about people replacing other folks. So a lot of the churn is just the same type moving in. Right. If you change the landscape a little bit, that's where the opportunity comes from, right? If you say, well, let's change this a little bit to make it a little more attractive to this type, you slowly change that landscape so that as the churn goes, you're attracting, the, attracting what you want to the area. Uh, and like in those transitional neighborhoods we have, how those get zoned will define which of those groups will stay. Just great, thank you.